Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you choose to watch this video. I'm Chris Weber, the pastor at St. Peter's Lutheran Church here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I pray that this video finds you well wherever you are today. Today we're celebrating the first Sunday in Lent, and we're going to do so by looking at a very familiar, most likely, but also a very difficult passage from Genesis chapter 22. Uh, dealing with a relationship between Abraham and God. Before we get to that, I invite you to have a seat if you haven't already done so. Stop whatever it is you're doing. And we'll take a nice deep breath as we remember again who we are because of the grace of God and Jesus Christ. We continue to be those who have been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, welcomed into the family of God by the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's continue to confess our faith today using again the words of the Apostles' Creed as it has been handed down to us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
A reading from Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him for now. I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Here ends the reading. To all of you children out there listening today, this is the season of Lent. This Sunday is the first Sunday in Lent, and Lent is a period of about 40 days leading up to the celebration of Easter. And traditionally, Lent is a time that we use to kind of get ready to prepare ourselves for Jesus. Now, if we're preparing for a thing like a birthday, we maybe make a cake or buy a cake, we buy presents, we decorate. If we're preparing for somebody to come over to our house, we may clean up the bathrooms, pick up the house. If they're spending the night, make sure they've got a place to sleep. There's lots of things that we do to prepare for different events in life. And Lent is a time of remembering that we're preparing for Jesus. He's risen from the dead and he's promised to come back. And one of the ways we prepare for him is doing a lot of things. We we continue to learn about him and his life and how it is that we follow him. So we might read the scriptures more with our family. Um, We spend maybe a little bit more time trying to focus on praying, of, of calling upon God to act in the world as we prepare for him to show up. Uh, And a third thing we might do is also work on how we enact our life of faith in him. We might strive to be more focused on trying to be loving and kind and generous towards our siblings, towards our parents. And other Christian people are striving to do the same at this time. It's not that we don't always prepare for um, Jesus in our life, but that Lent is a, a special time that we kind of focus on what it is to prepare for him to get ready for that great celebration of Easter, the remembrance that he's risen from the dead and that he's coming back again. So again, we're beginning into the season of Lent um, and today with the adults as well, we're gonna be digging into some challenging scripture passages in order to look at uh, how that shapes us in our life of faith as we trust and get ready for Jesus. To the rest of you out there listening today, our reading today from Genesis 22 is a disturbing story. And after more years of studying the scriptures, it hasn't changed for me. This is still a very disturbing story. God asks Abraham to kill his son, Isaac. And there is nothing that I can say or do today to alleviate how 
unsettling and disturbing this story is. But what I would like to do today is, is to remember that this story is not a standalone event. This is not the only interaction that God has with Abraham. This is an event that is situated in a much larger relationship between God and Abraham. And it's in that larger relational framework that I would like to consider this story today. Earlier on in Genesis, God calls Abraham for the first time tells him to leave his home country and says, I will bless you. I will make you into a great nation. And Abraham, amazingly enough, acts. He goes. He acts out of trust. And God continues to begin, or excuse me, God begins to bless him. And we see this taking place in the story of Genesis. Um, his people that he is with begin to expand. Their resources begin to expand so much so that he and Lot, his nephew, have to part ways to make sure that they have enough land for the animals that they are grazing and taking care of. Right? God provides enough and more than enough. He blesses Abraham. And yet there are moments where Abraham does not trust this provision of God. On two separate occasions, while underneath the authority of some other rulers, Abraham lies about his wife in order to protect his own skin. This doesn't seem like Abraham is fully trusting. He's kind of got some fears and doubts. And yet God persists to bless. And God even commits himself to Abraham at one point to say that he's going to have a child, a son, who is going to uh, be the one who continues on God's covenantal promise. God will keep his covenant promise to his son. But this promise is spoken to Abraham late into his 90s. And you know what Abraham does when he hears this promise? He laughs. This is absurd, right? Absurd to give a child to a man and a woman who are in their 90s. And yet God's faithfulness comes through even in the absurdity of those circumstances and where it seems like life is impossible. God blesses Abraham when he is 100 years old and Sarah when she's not much younger with a son. They name him Isaac and God commits his covenantal promise to Abraham to be carried on through this one specific son Isaac. Now in our story today, it is this son Isaac that God asks Abraham to kill. Did I mention that this story is disturbing? Did I mention that there is nothing I can say or do today to alleviate how disturbing this story is? And we shouldn't try to alleviate it because we'll end up putting words in God's mouth. We have to let God be God. God is God and we are not. But this event, again, is situated in this larger relationship of Abraham and God. It is a story that is not a standalone event. This is coming upon all these other events that I have mentioned, right? This is following upon multiple repeated acts of God's faithfulness, multiple repeated acts of God's blessings towards Abraham. He has expanded him and his possessions. He has even kept this absurd promise of giving a child to him when it seems like life is as good as gone from him and Sarah. Repeatedly, again and again, God is faithful and merciful, showing his desire to bless. And it is upon the foundation of this God who has repeatedly been faithful and blessing Abraham that gives the command for Abraham to kill his son. Again, this doesn't alleviate and raise, this, this often brings up more questions than anything. But it's important, I think, to recognize today that this command of God doesn't take place in a vacuum. It is coming from the God who desires to bless and has been faithful and merciful in the past to Abraham. To this absurd command of God, this command that stands in contradiction to the present circumstances, Abraham trusts, he obeys. He takes his son, travel for a time, they have wood, they have a knife, he binds his son up on an altar, raises the knife, and in the last moment, God stops him. And God has learned something about Abraham. He says, now I know that you fear the Lord. Even in this moment that seems to contradict the circumstances of what God had said in the past, Abraham is willing to trust, willing to offer his son. And God provides. 
and continues to provide. As we consider this story today and how we might apply it to our lives, we have to be very, very careful. This is a story where it is really easy to try to fill in the gaps, to fill in the thoughts of God or what he was intending to do. And we have to be really careful because it's never a good or a safe idea to put words or thoughts in God's mouth. Again, God is God and we are not. And this story for that reason will remain uncomfortable and disturbing for years to come. But what I think we can do in a very careful way is to look at this story with sort of three broad parallels to our life in following Jesus today. And that's what I want to offer for us today. Three broad parallels. The first, God's command to Abraham doesn't take place in a vacuum. And neither does our call from Christ. As Jesus beckons us as his followers to take up our cross and to follow him, it's not a standalone event. It's not just happening out of thin air. It is founded upon repeated acts of mercy and faithfulness in the past. We trust that God brought his covenant and his provision to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. We trust that Yahweh brought his people Israel out of slavery, out from under the oppression of Pharaoh, into a new relationship with him that he brought them into the promised land after feeding them for 40 years with manna in the desert where resources were scarce or non-existent. We trust that Christ proclaims and does his miracles, that he really was crucified and raised from the dead. I mean, consider the absurdity of that. Right? That is absurd that a corpse after three days would come back to life and then be crowned as Lord over heaven and earth. We trust that the Holy Spirit has continued to be given out to cultivate life in this world until the day of Christ's return. It is upon these events, repeated multiple acts of God's faithfulness and mercy throughout the centuries, that we continue to hear the call of Christ to say, come and follow me. And like Abraham, we are called to trust and to obey because of God's consistent mercy and faithfulness in the past, right? God's track record is one of mercy, one of faithfulness and commitment to his promises. And so we trust today. The second broad parallel for us, and this one's not a very smooth connection, but I think it's an important one to draw out briefly today. The call to follow Jesus often stands in contradiction to present circumstances. The reason I say this isn't a smooth connection to Genesis 22 is because the contradiction in Genesis 22 is entirely God's fault. God is the one who makes a promise to Isaac that his covenant will be through Isaac. And God is the one who asks for Abraham to take Isaac out of the picture. This intense contradiction is completely on God's shoulders and we have no good way of resolving this. The contradiction in following Jesus today is, is not in that same vein. It is still God's responsibility, but not on both sides of it. The promises of God today often stand in absurd and stark contrast to our present circumstances in this broken world. So for instance, if you go to a funeral, if you visit a grave, if you encounter death that seems to be all over the place on the news because it is a reality for our broken world today. Encountering that and then hearing the promise of Christ that a corpse came back to life and is now reigning with the promise of blessing for life for this world, that there is a, a promise of bodily resurrection, that sounds absurd. It sounds absolutely absurd. It sounds like it stands in immediate and stark contrast to the reality of death in this world. And yet, like Abraham, we are called to trust God even when there is a contradiction between his promise and the present circumstances. The world that we live in is a world that is often based upon scarcity. There's not enough time. There's not enough money. There's not enough resources. There is not enough. And in the midst of this world of scarcity, God promises that he has made enough through his abundance and he calls us to share out of that abundance that we have to share in order to bless other people who may not have. That 
call of God stands in contrast to the scarcity of this world, right? To trust God's abundance enough to give even what little we have to love and care for others. There's also the other reality that in this world there is this promise that the good life comes through status and wealth and that the reality of injustice often becomes the status quo because the status quo is easier, right? It's easier to be inactive. It is easier to hold on to our security rather than have a change in our life for the sake of somebody else. But God calls us in the spirit to act in just ways towards others, to act towards peace and equity towards others. And that's not always safe, right? That can seem absurd and even dangerous at times. The promises of God often stand in stark contrast to present circumstances. But like Abraham, we are called to trust the promise, even when it seems to contradict, again, our present circumstances. The third broad parallel that I would like to make with this text to our life today, um, we've covered two so far. So we have the um, that, that faith uh, doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? It's based on these other events. We have the contradiction of our present circumstances that can happen because of the promises of God. And the third one is that the faith of God's people continues to be in a state in which it needs to be proven. The end of the Genesis story that we had, we find out that God learned something about Abraham. He says, now I know that you fear the Lord. This implies that God actually didn't know how Abraham was going to respond to his command. He didn't know if Abraham would actually go through with it or not. And if God didn't know, then this statement of God is a flat-out lie. And so we have to believe that God learned something about Abraham, that he feared the Lord, that he was being faithful. Our faith is not predetermined in Christ. What I mean by that is how we will respond to Jesus tomorrow or the next day or the weeks ahead is yet to be determined. I don't mean this to be a terrifying reality to call our faith into question. That's not what I mean. Our faith is a gift from God instilled in us by the Holy Spirit. But as the Spirit works in us, we also have a responsibility to take ownership of what we believe and to carry it out in our life each day. Again, this is by the power of the Spirit, but it never, nevertheless um, brings with it the responsibility that we take ownership for what we believe to be true. We are called by Christ to shape our lives around the absurdity of the resurrection, right? We are to move in our lives towards his promises, to trust that he really did, the Son of God, take on flesh and enter this world, that the Christ was crucified and then raised from the dead, to trust in the midst of scarcity that God provides enough and that it really is more blessed to give than to receive. We are called to trust that status and power and wealth are not a means to the good life, but that the only true, real good life is found in Christ and in him alone. God calls us to continue to live out our faith, right? Each and every day to, to take ownership for what we believe to be true because of his past faithfulness and mercy. And Christ has been faithful Christ continues to be merciful and he continues to beckon to us. He has given the spirit to you and to me that is created and continues to foster faith within us. And there are times in life where we might recognize that we are acting out of doubt or we are acting out of fear or we are letting the present circumstances and how overwhelming they may be lead us away from following in the footsteps of Jesus. In those moments, I invite you to look back at the life of Abraham, not just the story we have from Genesis 2, but his entire life and see moments where he hacks out of fear, where he succumbs to the doubt of the present circumstances, and then to see how God acts towards Abraham in those moments. He persists. He persists in his blessing. He persists in faithfulness, working on and with Abraham again and again and again until we get to this point in Genesis 22 where we see Abraham acting out of this beautiful fear of the Lord in trust, even in the absurdity of the promise of God in that moment. 
Christ continues to beckon us to shape our lives around the crucifixion and his resurrection, to stake our lives upon it every single day and upon nothing else. Now may the peace that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the scriptures, these faithful accounts of your interactions with people, people like Abraham. We thank you that these faithful accounts have been handed down to us. And even in moments where the scriptures are challenging or we don't understand or they are just seem downright disturbing, do not lead us away from them, but help us to continue to engage them. Not that we may understand everything, but that by them you would shape us for faithful living, that you would lead us in a way that is faithful to Christ as we wait for him to come again. We thank you for the gift of the scriptures as they are a gift of your mercy, a continued telling of your faithfulness in this world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the gift of faith that you instill in us by the power of your spirit. We have not accomplished it. We have not earned it. We have been given faith as a gift. And even the perseverance of our faith into the future we trust is also a gift. Nevertheless, help us never to regret or to uh, neglect the responsibility that we have to take ownership for what we believe to be true every day. Move us, Lord, by that faith to, to take ownership to trust in the crucifixion and resurrection, to trust that Jesus has taken the role of a servant and therefore that reshapes our entire lives. Help us to see how we may live that out each day in faithfulness as you called Abraham and have called all your people to do. Lead us to do it, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, um, there are many people who are hurting and need in the world, people we know who are grieving, who are sick or in danger in various ways. Today, we lift up to you, especially the people of Texas and other areas that are still struggling because of not just power outages, but also cold weather in the power outages and the very serious danger of the loss of access to clean water. Provide life through water to the people that need it. Um, provide people and organizations to step up. And if there's ways that we can be of love and support, to help us to see how we can move in a way that supports life for people who are struggling today uh, down in Texas. Continue to also move us to see how we can do that in our everyday lives with local events and people. Um, and also if there's ways that we can interact as a church towards the wider culture and towards the world to be those that cultivate life. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting in your promises, we are bold to pray as you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Again, I pray that this video finds you well wherever you are today. And that the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. For he remains faithful and continues to call us in the peace he gives to trust and obey him alone. Before we close out here today, I have uh, two brief announcements I want to make. Um, next Sunday, the 28th, we are continuing our communion sign up by household. So if you'd like to participate in that. There are time slots available between 8.30 and 10 a.m. on February 28th. Um, so please get a hold of me. Uh, feel free to call me at the office and we can schedule a time for you and your household to come and receive communion on February 28th, again, between 8.30 and 10. The next Sunday, the first Sunday in March, March 7th, uh, we are going to be moving back to having indoor services as we did back in September on October. These will be shorter, about 20 to 30 minutes long, and will be involving serving communion. This, again, is not by household sign-up. This is time for us to gather together, uh, again, with masks and with distance, 
but that's going to be beginning on March 7th. There'll be more information coming out to you in the days ahead. If you have questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, once we start on March 7th, we'll be doing that for each Sunday through March as well. Again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out and ask about that. More information will be coming soon. Until we have the opportunity to see each other again, continue to remember that we are the hands, the feet, and the eyes and mouth of Christ in this world, called to trust him, called to act upon his promises, even when the present circumstances seem in complete contradiction with what he has committed himself to. Continue to stay connected together. We need each other. And until we have the opportunity to see each other again, I pray you have a blessed week.